Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. All three of us are professional illustrators. Uh, the three of us have all worked for the major publishers. Together, we've published somewhere around 75 children's books, and we've all taught illustration at university art programs. That is right. Each week, we come at you guys with different listener questions or fantastic illustrator interviews. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but each time you learn something, brand spanking new. I feel like today's uh, an arguing day. I'll argue with you. <laughs> you Hi. just have that look on your face that where you want to um, be argued with. I'm just ornery I, today. Today's an agreement day. I can see that oh. already. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I am back from Lightbox, and I want to report on it. I've been on assignment. I went and did a um, had a table at the Lightbox Expo. And for those of you who don't know what Lightbox is, it's a I call it a conference. I've been calling it a conference. Some people call it a con uh, or convention. But it really doesn't have a convention vibe to it. It has more of a, a conference vibe to it. Half the show, what it is, is it's a, a collection of of entertainment artists or people wanting to be in the entertainment industry or people who are in the enter- entertainment industry as artists. So people working in art departments in animation, TV animation, feature animation, um, movie art departments, uh, video game art departments, and uh, general illustrators, some comic book artists, some illustrators who have a more um, uh, entertainment vibe to them. So like Pete Morbacher was there uh, because his he's, he's doing like cards and gaming style stuff. But also you could see that as being like concept art for a video game if you want it. There's also like um, Sean Galloway who's who's online as Cheeks. He's more of a cartoony comic booky guy. Um, but he fits well with that group. And really what it is, is there's a, a show called CTN, uh, CTNX that X. went for years and years. Yeah. And, uh, and Lightbox was, it, it was a good show, but it was in some ways poorly run. You mean and, CTN? Yeah, CTN X. was. Yeah, CTNX. X. Right. It wasn't <laughs> CTN, it was CTNX. <laughs> Uh, CTN stands for the Creative Talent Network, and their show was CTNX. Um, and so that was really focused on animation. And um, Bobby Chu and um, and the guy who was running Emerald City Comic Con, uh, Jim Dimonakis, they both partnered up to do Lightbox, which would be a little bit broader for the entertainment industry, um, art departments. And run it a little bit better, make it a little bit bigger, get a bigger space. And they launched it in 2019 and it went great. And they're all set to do it for the next year. And then COVID hit. And for two years, they didn't run a physical show. So they did an online version of it. Last year, 2022 was the first live show. I went as just an attendee to check it out, to see what it was like, to kick the tires, see if I wanted a table there. And this year I had a table there. And I just want to tell you what it's like, why or why not you should go to this show. So it's well run. Like I said, it's there's two parts to it. I was I was going to say there is a, a tabling part where you have um, uh, you have I think it was ten rows of tables that were each maybe twenty artists on each side. So a ton of artists all sharing art books, prints things like that. And then on the other side, uh, in the other building, or two buildings, maybe it was three buildings, there were demonstrations, panel discussions. um, There was interviews with, uh, you know, creators and things like that. So, um, so it was just like this, this very balanced thing where you could go learn how to use the latest software for a particular, you know, like the latest version of Procreate or Procreate um, animation thing that they're doing. You could see people demoing that, but then on the other side, you could go meet these artists and buy a book or buy a print or a sticker or something like that. Um, and it's really, it, it honestly, it is so inspirational. The level, the 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 bar to 
to get into that show is so high to the point where I was kind of getting a little desensitized to how good some of these artists were. Um, I, I was just glancing shortly at certain tables because I was, there's so much to look at so much to take in that there were some tables I was just glancing at that, that at a normal con, like a Tucson comic con that I went in, you know, two months ago, they would have been absolutely the best artists there. Right. So it, it really so is. This is like the best of the best. It really is. It's a very artist centric show. And what's f- funny is, is, is the, the type of people that come to the show are professional or people who are students who want to be professional. So there's just this level of celebration and appreciation for the art and for artists. And it's not really, it didn't have like a, um, like a comic con vibe to it. Like, a almost like there's like a a flea marketness to some of these comic cons where yeah there's artists but there's also dudes like selling you know lightsabers and you know cheap lightsabers and there's also dudes selling like silly t-shirts and stuff like that at comic cons here it's really about the art um there was two cosplayers who came out of the whole show right so that kind of gives you what, it, what you know what the idea was and this was halloween weekend so we had two different cosplayers one came guy came as elvis nobody gave him any attention <laughs> he was strutting around <laughs> like hey you know at a normal comic con people are getting their pictures taken with elvis and people are just like oh hey dude uh, and, and moving <laughs> on <laughs> right right so um what so was your, what was your goal at the comic con why were you there yeah so well it's not not a comic con like i just said for That's Lightbox, so there's, there's right. the first for argument the, right there. Yeah, I don't know what to call. Disagree. What do I call? What do I call it? <laughs> it I'm the, calling the, the it a conference. The conference. Okay, what was your it, what was your goal at the conference? So was it to was it to just be around peers? Was it to sell yeah. something? What What do you want to do? My goal was to have a table, to essentially have the table fund the trip, right? Mm. Um, to pay for my Airbnb, to pay for the food, to pay for uh, gas, you know, gas to try tra- tra- travel out there, and hopefully make. Uh, to turn a profit. Um, and then the way that I set up my booth was to primarily um, address my other goal, which was to talk to people, to meet with people, and to really um, kind of fill my creative bank account. I work at home all the time. I, I love my family, be but out I with see people. them yeah. all the time, and I wanted to be around some some other professionals and creatives, right? So... A lot of people set up there. You've seen these tables set ups where they have the scaffolding, scaffolding that like, you know, reaches to the ceiling and it's covered in prints and there's stickers and it's just tchotchkes hanging everywhere and there's a little window in the middle, you know, like the DMV or something where you, <laughs> or a movie theater where you can there's like talk to them, <laughs> right? And and you know, barely shake their hand and whatnot. And I didn't want to do that because it it inhibited. Um, um, conversation. And so I decided not to do, deliberately not do prints. No prints at my table, just books and only two books. I have six books for sale or five books for sale, uh, six books, something like that. I have a ton of books for sale. I only brought two different books. And then I had a little uh, sample of pins that I was selling and, and some stickers. So everything was down low and and it left the, the space here for me to just talk with people and people come up and it facilitated conversation a lot better. Um, I got to see a lot of people who I used to work with or people just who I knew who this is the only time I see them and they come to the table and it's easy to like hang out and chat. And, and so for that, it was extremely, uh, it was an extremely successful show because A, it did turn a profit. I made twice as much as I made at the Tucson Comic Con. And nice. B, um, um, I was able to just talk to and hang out with and see so many people. I also went to the Concept Art Awards, which they, they hold on Friday night at Lightbox. And that was a really interesting thing, too, because um, it's like a, an actual award show. They had a live band there playing music as people were coming up to you know accept their award and whatnot. But the concept art industry is so just a bunch of kids coloring, you know, <laughs> and so 
for as professional as it was on some, you know, there's like people who worked on, you know, who worked with James Cameron and James Cameron won a, a lifetime achievement award and couldn't be there in person, but he recorded a special recording for the, the, wow. the, the show. And he's like, and he really, you know, spoke in our language as concept artists, as an illustrator. So it was really cool to see that. So that was super mm-hmm. professional. And then, you know, there's people who come up, they're like, they're not even wearing a suit and they're like, Oh man, I was not, I forgot this was even happening tonight, but yeah, thanks for the award. And, uh, yeah, I guess thanks mom, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, so it was, it was super interesting. Um, so the question I guess is why, why should you go to, to Lightbox or why would you attend Lightbox? Um, and I, I would say if you, you know, if you're looking for a job in the in the entertainment industry, absolutely, it's a great way to get FaceTime with people who work in that industry and a good way to like get contacts and network. Um, it's a good place to find other cool artists and to meet maybe some of your heroes. That's another great reason to go. If If you're more in the children's book illustration side of things, it might not be it'll still be cool to see all the cool art, but it might not be like the, your ticket to get a, your, a book deal, right? That's more SCBWI is more for you, uh, in, in that regard. But, um, I think, I think it's, uh, you know, essentially it's, it's a, it's a go-to place for, I would love it if the three of us had like, uh, an SVS table there or something because there are so many students and there is so many like, people geared towards wanting to learn their craft and get better at it. And, Mm -hmm. and we have, you know, an offering for that type of thing. It just might be cool to, to be there to represent and to, to do the thing. So that's, that's, that's where my report on Lightbox. Well, let me, I have a question because we talked a little bit about before you went, was there a, was there a theme that you saw in the content? You remember we were talking about the like the Little Mermaid theme we saw before at CTN years ago. Yeah. Uh, what was the what was the look or or was Let's there any see, th- was there any common thread? It was a little bit more diverse because it's so curated. So, um, th- what what I heard from an announcement that Bobby Chu made, who he he is I think sort of in charge or his team is sort of in charge of who gets in and who doesn't, and he said that we couldn't get in everybody into Lightbox who applied, obviously. But he said, what we're going to do moving forward is have, um, is have half, essentially the people who table one year will take a year off and can table again the next year to let those other people come in who Hmm. they couldn't fit into it. I wonder if he's really going to do that or if that's just his way of letting people down softly because there's some people who, table there who I can't imagine he would deny them a table the next year. There's such like a, a, you know, a Mm -hmm. solid anchor. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a combination of that. Like some people just get the auto pass, especially if they're friends with him and all that stuff. Personal relationships go a long way, but then does rotate out a couple of people who were on the fringe or whatever. Yeah. Me personally, I, well, I, I personally would love to be rotated out and not, I would love to, do one table every other year and just go as an attendee. Well, it's important. That's an important concept for people thinking about doing this anyway, because we, we, we found with the art fairs is you, you run out of customers. If they, if you're successful Mm -hmm. one year, that means a lot of people in the local market bought your stuff and Mm -hmm. sometimes they'll become a collector and buy something else. But sometimes they're like, no, I'm good. I got the thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's a dwindling, you know, each year we, we had a projection of profits when we first started doing art fairs where we're like, wow, we made this much this year. We'll probably make, you know, 20% more next year. Nope. It goes the other way because you, you don't have a big, a pool (laughs) of people. So we, we or you have to be, yeah, you have to be making enough new stuff that right, right, that it attracts it. But I mean, there's it's it's not many people who are going to want multiple things over years from you. Like I said, there is the collect right. that collector component, and there mm-hmm. is those people, and they're awesome. They're super fans, and they're great. But so, the average purchase did, is just. But like did they not max that. out the venue? As far as um, how many tables were filled? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. There's I mean, no room to expand then, because a lot of convention they, centers have, you know, 
Well, they can always open up like another room or something. They could. It could be a little more snug. Like there's a lot of space, which was really nice. It wasn't. uh, Okay, it sold out Friday and Saturday. So it was completely sold out show both days. So there were times where it was a little crowded, especially when people weren't at the the demos and and at the panels and stuff. Um, But I, you know, they could probably squeeze in one more row in the big hall and they could probably put a few more people in, in. They've got another side room that was a little loose and open, but you, you really can't go much, much further in that space. Um, but Let to your point, you, you, oh, well, I just want to finish. You asked, was there a common theme? Oh, yeah. They did really good about diversifying the types of artists that you got a lot yeah. of different stuff. So I didn't see, you know, essentially they kept, they sort of kept, there was a row of like video game artists. And then there was a row of like people who were really into comics. And I was on that row, you know, and I was between five people. There's five people on our side who all were selling comic books. And, uh, and so it was really cool to be like, okay, now I'm on the comic row. Okay. Now I'm on the, um, the cool art print row, you know? Um, so it was really, really carefully uh, done that way. Let's, I do want to talk since we since we do real talk here on yeah. this podcast real talk how much what it. did it cost to be there the okay. whole thing yes my expenses were for the whole thing um 1200 maybe 1300 dollars uh 450 dollars for the table uh i split an air i split an airbnb with uh with another artist benjamin shipper by the way who we interviewed and let me just say, he's a great, if anybody ever wants to share an Airbnb with Benjamin Shipper, <laughs> do it. He pays you promptly. He cleans mm. up after himself. Um, he locks the door when he leaves. So, <laughs> so he's not like he's a good Will guy. and I. <laughs> right. No, so the Airbnb the was about three, 375 We got We got a cheap house about a mile from the, the um, convention center. Um, I figured out why it was so cheap. It was like clean. It was it was lovely. It was furnished. It was a little Spartan. Nothing nothing special there. But I was up late one night in the kitchen. <laughs> there were like twenty roaches running everywhere, and oh I was my. like, okay. <laughs> oh my goodness! They could use a. a, 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 a Did you uh, tell the owner guy. that? No, I should have left that review, but. I, yeah, not I the not the public day. facing review, but the private review. You should definitely let him know. I only say that because I have my first rental yeah, this week. You would love to know that, wouldn't you? Um, <laughs> yeah, I want people to tell me privately. Hey, this thing is happening, so I can fix it. If you don't know it's a problem, yeah, mm-hmm. you, can't, you can't fix it. Well, that's pretty cheap, man. That's a that's a great use of funds. If it was mm-hmm. only that much and you got that much out of it, that's a great. Um, what would what would you call that? Cost benefit or whatever. Yeah, um, and I grossed forty one hundred. So yeah, so fine. Yeah, yeah. So you made yeah. a profit. You hung out with friends. I mean, all in all, that's a that's a kind of a that's dream a scenario. Yeah, yeah. I think it's good. I used to make maybe like at CTN, I would do five thousand in a weekend. Yeah, but you, but you you self limited your product. Yeah, um, and that was so, me selling prints and right. you know going going all out and having new stuff. And I did have some new stuff this time, but really this was all about more so about meeting people than than turning a huge profit right well it's a good good way to go in because then if you didn't make your table money back or your airbnb Mm -hmm. money back or whatever you you still have a positive takeaway from it so yeah i spent about 300 bucks on books just going around doing books oh, yeah. buying stuff <laughs> buying stuff but that mm-hmm. stuff that stuff pays off later because then you're like oh i want to do a book like this or inspira- inspiration in some way i mean it's mm. it's like you said we've we've since covid we were in a weird little spot where the people weren't out and seeing stuff and the fact that you came home with stuff maybe motivates you to make something and you'll make a lot more than that 300 bucks right right so I wanted to follow up. That was sort of my little excursion out into the real world, doing a table. I want to know what's going on with you, Will, and Pickleball Paul. You know, you, did, you were talking about doing a school visit. I know mm-hmm. you set up a table at something. We'll talk to you, and then, and then Lee's got something coming up. But tell us what's going on with you, Will. Yeah, all right. Well, yeah, so the, I, I had been documenting everything that I've been doing for this on my YouTube channel, but I've 
fell off the planet on that because just so many the project kind of took over as far as how much time it takes and Mm -hmm. And so I haven't been updating there, so it's good to be able to update here. And I actually did shoot a video that I still need to edit for my YouTube channel. But um, yeah, so uh, we, you know, we sent out um, books to some local schools to see if we get some school visits. Sent out about fifty, and we got five that want to have us. Three that set a point, four that set appointments. One that we're still trying to find a date, back and forth on. And um, so I did my first one, and I had said because I have these these books that you know I self published mm -hmm. along with my regular published books, um, you know I'm trying to see if I can sell them. And when like I'll just reiterate when you sell when you when you go to a school visit and the school orders your books from the publisher from your publisher. From my experience, I make about 50 cents a book. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I was to sell 100 books at that school, which I've done many times in the past, I get about 50 bucks, which is oh my gosh, nothing to even right. think of, right? <laughs> so you get, your, you get your honorarium, and the honorarium could be anywhere from $500 to $2,500, depending on the school. I've never gotten close to $2,500. The most I've gotten is 1000 for a day doing like three mm -hmm. presentations at a school and um and I've, I've gotten 800 to a thousand a lot of times but never uh, any more than that uh, but um i had told these schools in the letters that i sent out i said hey you know if you don't have a budget for an honorarium talk to me anyway because if we can send home my order forms then it, we can still make it work without that so i didn't want to mm -hmm. lose school visits and so and the first one was one such and they were like hey what if we only had you for one presentation so it's easier on you and we'll do the whole school you know the, the, the k through i think k through five is what we did and um but we can't pay you but we'll definitely send home your order form so i, so, I sold 98 books and that we we still are doing the the tally on exactly how much we made, but it was about. I, I'm going to estimate that profit was somewhere between five and seven hundred dollars for that one presentation, which was an hour long. So not mm -hmm. bad, and it was a it was a twenty minute drive mm -hmm. from our house. So it was in the morning nine nine to ten, done, mm -hmm. and uh, signed all the books and everything, and um, actually ran out of. A certain book so we've got to drive some back over there when we, we we put in an order to get some of the books that we ran out of but it, it it's um i think it could be really lucrative because the other school visits i have are paid and they're i've got one for 800 i've got one for 400 the 400 is another just single presentation so i you know i said my day rate's 800 dollars and and they said well we have one presentation how much did that cost and like how about 400 they're like, okay, so mm -hmm. if I do the same, they're also going to send home the order forms, and then mm -hmm. not not too shabby, right? If you could make yeah. fifteen hundred dollars in a day um, for 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 doing that, and it promotes your book, get your books out there, sell books and stuff. Then I would, I also give. Would the idea be to uh, like scale this up and have like a, a season? Where you're like, okay, for two months out of the year, I'm doing school visits every every day of every week. You know, this is kind of what we're thinking because we're we're not retired. We're semi. I mean, mm -hmm. I have a good lifestyle, right? Yeah. Like like I have a paid off house, so I don't need to make a ton of money. Um, but I, I mean, I love to make money. We we save the money we make uh, most mm -hmm. of it. But um, you know. I, you know, I definitely work with you guys on SVS Learn and, you know, we're getting ready to make another class. So we've got that work going on. I've got this. Mm -hmm. I've got another project. And our thought is, I don't really want to be in the schools like David Bedricki every day. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to. And my, what we're kind of thinking is, in this valley down here in Phoenix, there's probably about three to four hundred elementary schools within driving distance you know yeah. i mean within within an hour um 
and so those are the ones that we're going to to market to and if we could get 10 to 15 or 20 school visits a year that's mm-hmm. plenty for me mm-hmm. and it's a good extra chunk of money if you yeah. if if the average was let's say you know, that we made was you know fifteen hundred dollars per visit which i think is what we're what it's going to look more like if you we mm-hmm. did 10 of those that's an extra 15 grand in the year that we can you know pay some bills yeah then you're not killing yourself yeah yeah it's it's really and it's fun we can do it together um where and lily is doing all the the accounting so you know we had we did the order form we said you know attach the check or cash a lot of them put cash in an envelope wow. so there's like all this cash to to go through and and tally up and make sure it's the right and you know and some people fill out the order form wrong and they they pay for a soft they pay for a soft cover but they wanted a hard cover you know so we're trying to figure that out what do we do there you know and mm-hmm. little things like that but, okay. it's um, interesting because a lot of illustrators i mean to to kind of wrap up kind of what we're talking about here a lot of illustrators do a book and then this is how they sort of make money because the publishing industry is not great in terms of long-term income from a project. Mm-hmm. Um, it, to, just to give a little background, um, if you get a book deal, a lot of times it's gonna they're gonna pay you between three and five times small payments, and right. then you do the book over the course of a year. Well, those five payments get eaten up. Then what are you supposed to do at that point? Get another book, or a lot of people what a lot of people do. What Will's talking about here is they start to do school visits, mm-hmm. and that's how a ton of our artists and authors make an income out of this business model of being in, in, mm-hmm. in publishing. I've never done it, um, but some people are quite successful at it. Mm-hmm. And I, we keep talking about having David Bedricki on the show. We'll get him eventually, but not to completely steal his thunder, but I mean, like, if someone, and there's a lot of people like him. Um, I illustrated a book like uh, called Santa Pups by Jerry Pilata, and Jerry's one of those guys that's in the school's Every week, like like mm-hmm. I mean, is, it books as many school visits as he can. The thing is, from think about it from a publisher standpoint. So a publisher could work with the person who is, wants to just be an illustrator and stay at home, and or they can work with an author or author illustrator who is going to basically try to put out a book a year that they write and illustrate, mm-hmm. and during the school year they're going to be in the schools. All right, mm-hmm. and selling their books. So I would estimate, like, just based on what I've done in the past, it seems like for some reason it seems like every school I've gone to, they sell about a hundred books. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. It's just right it's just around a there. Standard kind of Not number. Yeah, budget. it's really weird. So <laughs> Not fifty. But if you sold a hundred of your book, and let's just say, you know, there's there's 180 school days a year, and let's say you were, I mean, I know David is booked in. Almost 180. I think he said last year he did 163 school visits or something. That is crazy. It's crazy. So, but let's say you did 100. Let's keep the math simple. Okay. You did 100 school visits Mm -hmm. and you sold 100 books at every school visit. You Mm -hmm. yourself. Of your book. That's 10,000 books. How many books do you think a publisher needs to know that you're going to sell before they sign you for every single book you want to? Publisher right. would be thrilled to know a guaranteed 10,000 books. They're never going to not publish David's books or Jerry's books because there is no risk on their part. They have absolutely mm-hmm. zero risk working with a guy like that or a gal because, because so, they guarantee they come with 10,000. They're like, I will sell 10,000 of these books. Fine. I don't care what the book is about. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. And they get, to, they get to write what they want. Now, you also, just to shift gears a little bit, you also sent us a photo of a table you had set up. Where was that? So that was just here in our resort. And Can you share that, Jake, we, for those of you guys who are watching on yeah. uh, YouTube? We have a vendor day here. Up. It's like a mini... Uh, it's a vendor day. <laughs> what is it like? It's, it's, it's like a hodgepodge of everything. It's like a farmer's market here mm-hmm. in our resort. Yeah, there we go. And nice. so there's, there's you get Meryl, pickleball How did you tent? get Meryl Streep to be <laughs> at your... Yeah. Do you know what's funny is so many people have told her... Like, people have asked for her autograph before. 
I mean, really? I, I, looking at this, if you said Meryl Streep was selling books, <laughs> I would, I would, I wouldn't even doubt it. Uh, for, for those of you guys who are wondering what we're talking about, Will's wife looks like Meryl Streep. I mean, not just barely. Yeah, it's not just right. a passing She's you know, resemblance. That's she so looks exactly like her. I'm going to have to have her listen to this episode. So that will make her happy. That's hilarious. <laughs> I see it. So, so looking at your table, you've got a like a corner here. It's mm-hmm. to, what eight feet on each side, maybe it's a ten you, foot table or ten foot. It's a ten. It's a ten by ten. Easy. Ten up. by ten. Okay. Mm-hmm. How? I've never seen someone do that before. You you have your display book on top of your stack of books, so yeah. doesn't it get a little fumbly when people want to buy a book? You just uh, things are tipping over. Is that just a because of a space thing or how would or you do it? I would do them behind. I'd have the stack the stack of books and then have the book behind the stack. Mm. But I guess it wasn't a problem, was it? It wasn't a problem. Okay. Yeah. This is real, like, nitty-gritty insider <laughs> baseball. Brass <laughs> This is what we do, yeah. Um, I yeah, mean, if I, you never set up a product, if you never set up a booth before, these become huge issues. Like, right. oh, crap, my, my prints are flying in the wind. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> that was, you know, well, so I have to clip should. the bottom, too, now. Here's, here's another thing. You've got to have a little, a little toolbox of, of, like, tape, wire, zip ties, markers. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole thing. So, all sorts of stuff, uh, post-it notes, because... go No, go back to that picture again, Jake. Okay. Because I bought these white markers, you know, the, the mm-hmm. little markers that are that write on black. Right. Yeah. And my my so, my, my um, price tags, I have these long strips of, of black cardboard to write. Yeah. And I was going to write the white on there. Of course, I couldn't find those. I bought them. I don't know where they went. Yeah, you know, of course. Right before. And I also bought those uh, black tablecloths. I had to run out and buy them again the night before because I, I put that bag somewhere and we were tearing the house apart and <laughs> couldn't find it. So it's just. So funny. But I had post it notes. So I cut them, taped yeah. them on there. And that's why there's those little purple. They were supposed to be black, white on black, you know? But yeah. anyway. But I, I didn't do that well at this show um and i probably won't do this one again and the reason is um the people that live here most Mm -hmm. of them well one well a couple reasons one it's early in the season and most of the people weren't back so the lady next to me was like you know there's the foot traffic is really low on this show Mm -hmm. december's will be and january's will be a lot higher in, in february so but anyway um they i thought you know maybe they'll want children's books for their grandkids most of them were telling me i'd buy one but my my grandkids are like adults now like they're all too old here <laughs> the people that live here are all too old <laughs> the they don't have aged out old. they're 105 yeah, they don't have um grandkids so we <laughs> their sold grandkids are 35 years old <laughs> yeah i think we only sold like 300 dollars that day but it was That's only funny. from it was from nine to one so in four hours we sold Three hundred dollars. Yeah, bucks an hour, not bad. Yeah, and that's not profit. That's three hundred dollars total. The booth space is twenty five bucks. So well, you can't beat that. So it was uh, it was profitable, and we lived here. So yeah, Yeah. easy 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 setup. I probably I probably wouldn't waste my time doing that one again. But the school visits are lucrative, so I'm Mm going to get into that. Lee, what's going on with you? All right, so I'm diving back into doing shows. I haven't. You know, I was doing a bunch of them, a bunch of art fairs and stuff before COVID and haven't done any really since then at all. Uh, and so I'm diving back in. And so I thought I'd answer somebody, you know, what we're talking about here as a common denominator is getting out in the world, how, you know, we make all our art in our studios, but then that's not the end of the job. If you, you know, we talk about being a pro here, we're, you have to go out in the world and do stuff. And this is, you know, each of us is trying to figure out how to do it with our own personal work and all that stuff. So I'm diving back in, but now I'm in a new market. I'm in, I'm in Denver. So I was, when I was showing a bunch, I was in Portland and I had that system dialed. Like I knew what every show potential was. I knew how many, how, you know, how many attendees would show up. I knew what the market liked and didn't like, and I just had it all figured out. And then I moved to Tennessee and I had to start over and mm-hmm. you, you know, I entered a couple of shows that I did as much research as I can, but you just don't know. And I did a couple of shows that were pretty successful, um, started getting a, 
uh, some sense of what that market was like. And then I move again. So I'm stupid because I keep moving all the time. Well, now I'm in Denver and I am literally starting at ground zero. So I'm having to answer the same questions that some of our listeners are probably wondering how, how do I know where to go? What do I show? How do I know if it'll be successful? You know, Mm -hmm. all those, all those questions. Now the one difference is I've done a bunch of shows, so I've got, I've already got some gear. Um, I don't have to wonder like how my booth is going to look. That's a whole separate thing that all, all three of us have had many versions probably of how we show Mm -hmm. the work and what we show. Um, but I am at ground zero. And so the difference with the markets that I'm showing in, I'm, I'm more of a show more in the fine art market. And the difference is a, they're really hard to get into. I mean, they can like the cherry Creek summer show. That's one of the biggest national shows here. Uh, they had like 800 entries, all pro artists, and they had 60 spots. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so I got, 60. Yeah. I entered twice under two different artist names just to try to <laughs> give my chances up a little bit. And, um, and I got, interestingly enough, both artists um, got uh, waitlisted. Uh, Lee oh, White nice. and Antonio Blanco mm-hmm. who paints the landscape. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, if you do get into some of these markets, they are expensive. Uh, like, for example, so I, I applied to another show that's coming up, a Christmas show. And I've, I've never been to these shows. I, 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 I like entering shows when the, the ideal way to do it is to go as a patron first, see how much of a crowd there is, see who, if people are carrying around packages and buying stuff. That's a good sign. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you apply the next year. Well, I don't have the benefit of that. I would, I didn't go to any of these shows last year. I didn't even know about them. Right. So I'm looking at them just try again, starting out with just a straight Google search. Oh, you know, what's it? This one's called the Cherry Creek holiday market. So it's mm-hmm. not the same group that's doing the summertime. So that's how I found it is like, Oh, is Cherry Creek doing a winter show? The same group that does the summer show, which is very profitable. Um, and again, hard to get in. Well, I'll come up with Cherry Creek holiday market. Different group, um, sort of a different location in this kind of a wealthy area of Denver. And that's sort of what you want to look for for that market because you need people with disposable income. Um, So I applied and I got in. Now, this is a weird thing. And I don't know if it's like a, uh, I don't know how to think about it. But like for me, when I don't get in, I tend to think of it as being a better show because they didn't (laughs) let me in. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I only want only want them if they don't want me. That's my mind. Right. <laughs> but the, but this one this 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 show wrote back real quick. They're like, "You are in," and I don't mm. know if I fit a specific thing that they were looking for. Mm. But my a red flag goes up. I'm like, "Wait a second, buddy." <laughs> <laughs> any any club that would have me as a member, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So then I was well, really suspect of, of what, the, of, of all of it. You know what I mean? Like I'm scared. So now I'm like doing research. Uh, so it's, it's a different kind of show. There's, there's like 20, 25 booths, not mm-hmm. many. I mean, this is not a big show and the, the whole thing stays up for a month and a half total. Oh, and wow. so, so I'm looking through the holiday here. I'll share some of this stuff if you guys want to see it. Yeah. Um, so I'm in the process that a lot of you will be in if you decide to do this stuff is I'm, I'm looking at it and seeing, okay, do I want to be here? I'll show you the costs in just a second. Um, but these are the other kind of people. And this is what makes me think of why they accepted me so quick is if you can, for those of you guys who aren't on YouTube, it's, it's a bunch of just uh, Christmassy kind of things that would be great. There's mm-hmm. like, a vintner and and a, a candle maker and you know some of these like I'll click on some of this stuff if I can well, here SoCo Gift Company I don't even know what that is um, Bigfoot yeah, yeah they, just making they do laser printed wood um, like cu- wood custom things. custom ornaments decorations yeah ornaments stuff like that yeah and so I know they got, you've got a lot of like there's people who sell homemade soap and there's people who sell like I, I mean, this, this company sells like company uh, uh, custom what, pickles and salsas and stuff like that. And so it, normally when I do a fine art fair, it is all just art. So that's my that's my first. Uh, so what's my second red flag? First red flag is they accepted me too quickly. What's paid second red mind? flag is that it's not all art. And so that instantly tells me I can't sell originals there. It, mm-hmm. I would be way over if somebody's next to me selling three dollar pickles and I'm selling a twenty five hundred dollar painting. 
I've I've lost the market there. Mm, so right. so what I what I'm now thinking is it's going to be prints, cards, um, books. Maybe a great place for that. Um, here I'll show you the uh, I'll show you the cost breakdown real quick. Let me pull. You know up. what it is while you're looking that up. This is yep. the person going here is they're not there to find like the ultimate gift for a family member. They're looking for stocking stuffers. They're looking right. for like little ancillary like gifts that they can take to a holiday party or yeah, or it's just like point that. of purchase. They're down there. They're like, oh, I like this scarf, and oh, here's mm -hmm. some here's some caramel corn, and and oh, I'll buy a card or a print or something mm -hmm. like that. They're not going to be there for a two thousand dollar framed. Oh, uh, so you painting. can be there. Every, you can choose a block of days. Yeah, it's interesting. So I've never done one that's this model. So so it's November sixteenth to December twenty fourth, and then the the hours are crazy. I mean, it's like it's like I'm opening a month long store, twelve wow. p.m. to seven p.m. every day, uh, or or you know roundabout like that mm -hmm. those hours. Yeah. Um, you if you choose the full month, you're there from November to uh, to December, November sixteenth to December twenty fourth. That costs nine thousand three hundred dollars to be a part mm -hmm. of. That's more than that, a month. You know. Yeah, a month and a week, but those are big months. I mean, that's Thanksgiving and oh, yeah. and you know Christmas. But I mean, that's a huge month. Um, so block two is uh, is about two weeks, and you can do a November sixteenth to December ten, or or the eleventh of December to the twenty fourth. Forty eight hundred bucks for those two weeks, or the one I'm choosing because I haven't done it yet is. Um, I think I'm going to choose December fourth through December tenth for sixteen hundred and fifty bucks. That's a mm -hmm. lot of money. Mm -hmm. To get in, that's a lot to be down. If I didn't live in the local market, there is no way I would do this because mm -hmm. I would have travel costs and hotel and all that kind of stuff. Right, right. Um, but so going back to some of the stuff that Jake was talking about, my goal isn't necessarily because you guys may be thinking, well, should I? How do you know if you should do it or not? And right. it depends on what the goal is. It, if if the goal is, oh man, I'm going to make a killing. I don't know if that's going to be possible or if that's even likely um mm -hmm. my goal is i don't know anybody here in this market yet um and so what happens at a fair or or, or some of these conventions is you start to learn about where the resources are for local markets and so for mm -hmm. example if when i go here i hope i make my booth feed back that's going to be my my goal mm -hmm. but you might meet one person who says, oh, man, have you done this show that's in the summertime? You should check that one out. There's a ton of people there or whatever. Um, so you start making these connections with uh, different artists, different vendors, and also people. Some, there, was, there was a show I did. I don't know if I've told this story. I probably have on the, on the podcast before. But there was a show I did in Seattle that was really terrible. I barely made my booth feedback. It's one of the worst shows that I've ever done. But I met one person there who owned a... Gal uh, a, a print gallery in Seattle and since that show I'm not kidding I've probably made 15,000 20,000 from her alone wow just selling prints matter of fact that's what I'm doing all day today I just got the huge Christmas order it's, it'll probably be $2,500 print order and that was from that crappy show that was just meeting one person. Yeah. So yeah. that's my goal is you never know who's going to stop by your booth. Yep. You never know what opportunities are going to happen. And you just got to be open to that. Because if you went in thinking, oh, I'm going to make a killing and you don't, you're just this grumpy, sour person. I just want to <laughs> meet people, <laughs> see what the market is yeah. like. Maybe it's a bust and maybe it's not. I, I have no idea. And, and, and so to that, to that point, I just want to sl slip this in there. I got a message from someone who backed my last Kickstarter and they just said, Oh, I've been a fan of yours ever since you did. It was a holiday vendor show like that downtown Provo. I set it up for one evening and I sold my comic books and they're like, yeah, I'm, I met you at that thing and bought one of your books and I've been a fan ever since. <laughs> I didn't right. make a ton of money there, but then that person, you know, the, the 10 people I bought stuff from went on or that, that I sold stuff to went on to buy future books, future uh, projects, back, you know, back future yeah. projects. Well, I, I have had a few people who start with buying a single card and then they'll come back the next year, they'll buy a print, then they'll buy a couple <laughs> of prints and then they end up buying an original. And it's a crazy to see that cycle happen. Mm -hmm. So if you look at every person like, oh, you suck, you just bought a $3 card, thanks a lot. Well, it's going to end there. But if you look at every person as a potential relationship that's long term, that's why these things are so great is that we own these products that we were putting out there and there's mm -hmm. a life cycle to them. And it's not just that product. It's, it's us as a brand. 
And if you start thinking of it that way, you know, we talked about proof of concept. That's where I am here in the Denver market again, because yeah. I'm starting over. And that's where everybody is in the first year or two. If you decide to say, okay, hey, I'm going to try this out. You're not, your goal isn't money. It, your goal is to see what sells and then say, mm-hmm. okay, well, they didn't buy this, but maybe I can change it to this. And then you start selling something different. It sells more. You have more information. And so the first year or two is just information gathering. It's not about profit. And it makes it a lot more acceptable if you run it as a test and not as a, oh, man, I need to make a killing. And this other artist made $20,000. Why didn't I make that much money? You know, it's mm-hmm. you can't go into it with that that kind of attitude. So how do you know you're ready to table, to have a table at one of these places? Is it, do you have a certain amount of artwork? Do you have a certain level of professionalism in your artwork? What do you I would say think? if you're still, one of the hallmarks is if you're still struggling to find your style, mm-hmm. like if you have not settled on a look to your artwork, you're probably not ready because you're going to have what, I can't remember if it was Jake or Will said it earlier, like this sort of flea market look when you've got all this different kind of styles yeah. and everything it just looks really bad mm-hmm. um, so if you have a definitive style um, I would start out selling online first and just mm-hmm. see what the interest is see what kind of stuff people are buying and what the price point is um, if otherwise you're just truly starting from scratch and you have no data and that's mm-hmm. a tough place to be because <laughs> one of the hardest parts um, as you know will the picture of will's booth kind of shows is there's a physical component to this. How much are you going to bring to a table or a booth? How do you set up the booth? All that stuff. If you're just starting, if you're like just making some images, you're like, okay, I'm going to do a a convention. That's a big, that's a big leap. Mm -hmm. But if you've already started selling stuff online, maybe you got a couple of different products that, that are selling even in a small way, then you start to um, be a good candidate for moving into that physical kind of realm. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I th- I think that you just just imagine uh, I mean like you should definitely walk shows yourself before you before you ever do table you should really go and see what stands out what do you gravitate to look down the row and look at the look at the the um, the booths that are getting more uh, activity more customer activity than other ones and and try to figure out why. Um, and just know how noisy visually those shows are and anything you can do to cut down on that noise when they get to your booth and which to me means having a strong brand Mm -hmm. you know like you're you're calling it style lee and i would say Uh, brand is a better word i'd go one step further and say make it look like a brand you know like Mm because because people want they want to collect something from from a brand that is that looks like it's gonna go somewhere. I don't know how else to say it, but like like ooh, this is really cool. Look at all this stuff. Ooh, I got to get something mm-hmm. from here, you know. Um, and I I really think there's like if you're talking about like Lightbox, uh, even though I haven't been there, but I feel like it's kind of CTNX 2.0. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you you're you're not going to be able to compete on the quality of your drawing so much as you'll be able to compete on offering something unique something that people want right so Mm -hmm. one thing that people are doing at those shows is they collect art books really really nice art books like they have to be really nice um they like collections but Mm -hmm. i would say the other thing they collect is gifts for for family members and stuff. So I don't know. Did, did fan art do well there? Did, were there a lot of people doing fan art or was it not a it's, thing there? So it, yeah, there was some fan art, but it was stuff like, um, over the garden wall fan art or adventure time fan art. It was mm-hmm. like a little more really specific animation specific, mm-hmm. you know, there's like gravity falls, um, mm-hmm. a lot of Miyazaki fan art. Um, but I'd say fan art was, was, a was definitely in the shadow of original, like mm-hmm. a lot of people's OC stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so, so that's the other thing is, is you got to do a little bit of your homework to know what sells a, a particular show. Lee might have, you know, five Miyazaki prints ready to go, uh, fan art prints ready to go for this thing and might not sell a single one of them because people in Denver may not know 
what it is mm -hmm. uh, right. or vice versa. It might be like that might be the hot seller and everybody's looking at him like, you know, we didn't realize people loved Miyazaki so much here. Mm -hmm. Right. Here right. At, uh, I've never done, I've never done a, a fan art print. I, I, maybe I should do one just to see how that would do. I've never done a single one. Mm. It, it would be ridiculously cool to see uh, Studio Ghibli done in your style. Like your take when you did that Superman or that Batman one, it was oh, just yeah. it was just a take. Nobody ever done that take on Batman. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then the same with Will. But I mean, you did. I kept telling you you should do. I want to see really cute superheroes in your style or pop culture figures in your style. People loved it. Yeah, they loved true. mixing it up a little that bit. That was a fun project to work on. Yeah, I there's other things that you can do if we're talking about tabling that where you can actually uh, do things that other people aren't really thinking of. What, who's that? This is just, you know, if you're on, on YouTube, you could see this is one of the artists that were there and this is one of the prints that they were selling. Here's That's another pretty. one here. Really pretty. Uh, yeah. Who is it? Let's give him a shout weird. out. This is, um, I don't have their card on it so just give me a second but if you're you know if you're just listening they they were doing these um really nice like block printing effect i think these were all um uh risograph prints done on a, a risograph machine mm -hmm. no idea what that means uh, uh look it up it's it's super cool it's a uh, it does like offset printing but with a a, a copy machine so there's like four different plates that it'll make. You could you could stick a piece of paper in there for it to photocopy, but then there's four different plates that it'll separate it out and pr and run it through the machine four different times to print to print on cool. it. It's, it's super sounds cool. Interesting. I don't know. Um, sounds interesting. I wrote down uh, I wrote down the name here. I I can't remember where where it was. Anyways, I'll. Oh, okay. Here it is. Um, no, that was a different artist. <laughs> I can't can't remember the name. I'll, I'll I'll tell. It'll be in the show notes. I'll tell. Needs, uh, needs some better branding. If you can't find the name, there's a problem mm. with that well, branding. They had good branding, uh, uh, good enough branding. I just um, I just lost the business card. I oh, guess. Gotcha. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it should have hey. been like. You know, duckprint.com or something like that. That's easy to remember. <laughs> I wanted to say that there are, there's more to tabling. There's so much more to tabling than just setting your stuff out there. There's, and then there's an art to, to the marketing of tabling, you know? Mm -hmm. There's a whole other thing. Like, like one of the things that we did that worked really well was we printed up l little five by seven prints that didn't cost that much. We printed up like 500 of them. And we, we would use those and say, hey, for the first 50 people that get to our table in the first hour, we're giving these away until they're gone, 50 of them, right? And we would always get 50, 60, 70 people, sometimes 100. And the people that were like, you know, towards, they'd be lined up sometimes when we'd get to our booth. And we'd say, oh, what the heck, we'll, we'll, we'll give them to you guys too because you waited in line, right? But we would also say, um, this entitles you to half off of anything in our booth. So you can, we'd print that on the back, right? It's a half off coupon. So you can come mm -hmm. back anytime during the day and get half off. And we sold probably, I would say, if we gave away, you know, to 50 people, we'd sell to 10 people that probably wouldn't have bought from us, you know? Uh, yeah. Now, so, now would that would that fifty percent sale? This is what I always wonder about sales like that. Is that would the fifty percent off piss the other people off who bought it at full price? I don't think they knew about it. You know what I mean? Like the people that got there that heard about the fifty percent off mm. got gotcha. it, and no one else ever heard about it during the day. Um, Those are great, and, and there's such a markup on prints anyway. That yeah, these are fun. These are really nice. Yeah, her name's Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca She, I think is how it's pronounced, and okay. um, really nice. she does these really cool uh, Rizzo prints, and um, it's it's pronounced or it's, it's spelled S H I E H. 
So go kinda check her out. Kind of has a um, Pascal kind of feel to it. Yeah. Definitely yeah, does. The, r- the room, yeah. It's a kid in the room doing something with the, all the messy stuff everywhere. With the cat. Definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Stole my cat. I'm, I'm the owner of cats. <laughs> So All we right. also we'd also do like drawings where we'd have like we'd say put your name on the list for a free print one of these yeah. free prints back here and then Wayne would would text every single one of them and told them they won. <laughs> one thing oh I would goodness. highly wow. recommend doing too is um make sure you you everybody who goes to your table whether they buy something or not signs up for your newsletter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get their email, and the reason you want to do that, and and you should definitely do this at Ch- Cherry Creek Lee. It's a good idea. Is have a have a newsletter sign up. Is just say, you know, if you want updates, I'm not going to spam you. I'm just going to let you know the next time I'm in town, or the next time I have a table, or the next time I have a new piece of artwork good. or something like that. You know, I, I've collected emails at almost every show, and have amassed probably a couple thousand emails. Lost them all, everyone. No. How? You didn't uh, input them? No. <laughs> so, so the thing is, the, the week after you get home, you you yeah, put I've them in your. That, that only took a decade to learn that. That I need to when I get an email, you actually record the email. It's a good yeah. good idea, good advice. And then send an email out that says it was good to good to meet you. I I just did that this last week because I did a, a lightbox follow up email for my newsletter and smart smart man just kind of said it was good to meet everybody. Um, and then it what, what was funny is I have a friend Jed Henry who he tables at fifty different cons every year, and I signed up for his email list in Seattle because we were both at a convention in Seattle. So now I'm always getting emails from him saying, "Hey, I'll be in Seattle, <laughs> you know, this weekend." Come check out the booth, and it was really kind of cool to see how he uses that because he knows. Oh, if I got this email here, this person probably um, is from around here. Um, so let me ask you guys this: we'll 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 wrap it up with with this. You know, we talked about how do you know if you're ready? You have your style. Um, we've talked about what should you try and get from a table. Money, of course, is one of the main reasons you, you, you do that. But I think a bigger one is these personal connections. And don't disc- discount those personal connections. What you should sell at a con really depends on the research that you do um, beforehand. You might find that books don't sell at all at this particular con, so don't bring books, but bring mm-hmm. prints. Um, or, or show or, or tabling, you know, wherever you're, a farmer's market or an art market or something like that. Um, so you just have to do some homework. I think, though, I want to say this, though. Pins will sell anywhere, anywhere and mm. everywhere because it's, it's small. That. They're usually pretty affordable. You could, you can, I price mine at $12 a pin mm-hmm. or buy two, get the third one free. Mm-hmm. So I was, but people were buying two pins all day long and getting that third one free. How much did it cost um, you? Um, two fifty. Okay. A piece. Um, so it's a good, good markup. How many do you have to order to get to two fifty a piece? I order about a hundred. Okay, so not a per ton. pin design. Yeah. So, um, so pins are pins are a really good one because it's it makes a nice gift, but it's also a nice memento and. And there's just pin collectors out there, and I've become a pin collector. So now, anytime there's a pin available out at a place that I go to, I'm buying that pin as like a memento for that visit. And I could look at my pin board, and I could see when I visited, you know, the the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, but also, you know, the Desert Botanical Museum, and you know, out in the middle of of Arizona, and and the time that I went to Utah and went to this one museum, there's a little pin that represents that. So it's it's kind of a cool thing. And and if you you know if you know you could sell them, you might make a pin that's um, colored the certain colors of the the town, the city that you are doing a, a show in. So it's something very unique to that city or, or or something like that. You know, you might pick their their football team's colors or the college's colors there or something like that mm-hmm. um i would say we'll, we'll 
one other thing, and maybe we'll close with this, is your post convention, whether you're attending or whether you had a table there, um, you've met a ton of people. And what you do after that is, I think, really key to making sure it's a full success. So unlike Lee, when you get a ton of emails, you don't lose them. <laughs> you don't let them, you know, <laughs> float away in the wind. What I do Touché. is I have I have a con um, notebook, and I'll, I'll just grab it here. Or you know, and he mentioned losing the emails, Lee, or your money bag. Yeah, I also lost a money bag with three thousand dollars in it. I'm not great at yeah. this stuff. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to remind you that because I know that just about the Ooh. time that you forget about it and the pain that goes stung, away. That's stung, man. Like Every time I think about it, it's that stings. <laughs> So I have this, uh, it's called con ephemera. Um, And what it is, is the whole time you're at a table or anytime you're talking to people, you're getting business cards or you're getting prints or whatnot. And you just have a stack of them after the con. Uh, And what I've always done in previous years is like, I don't know what to do with these now. I don't know who was important, who I needed to remember, who I wanted to keep in contact with and who I was just taking a card to be polite, you know. Um, and so what, I, what I'll do is I'll take an hour and sift through that pile and just make two stacks. Uh, make a stack of, you know, not important. I'm just going to toss this card and make a stack of want to keep in touch with or want to follow this person's artwork or I want to buy, you know, a print of theirs. So you have those two stacks. You get rid of half of them. Then the other half you keep and you put into one of these... Um, little it's so i have a folder here with um um sheet protectors and you just put all the business cards in there and you have it in this this little thing and i have them labeled each year is labeled um you know lightbox 2023 lightbox 2022 um and i can go back easily and and find those things but then i also keep in a notebook um i just make a list of who i met and why, like one quick note about why I want to remember them. So it's mm-hmm. like, uh, I met this one guy, he worked for Joe Mad, uh, the comic artist, but in his, on a video games thing. And he wanted to just connect and talk about making books. And, um, and so I wrote that down so that when his name pops up again, I can kind of remember who that guy is and there's another like Rebecca she who I showed earlier I just wrote next to her I, I bought some cool prints and so when I am going to Lightbox again next year or I'm going through and and you know want to just remember who I should follow up with or anything I can go back through this and be like okay one of these says keep in touch so I should text that person and just see you know what they're up to or shoot them an email or dm them or something like that and that's sort of like my post-con ritual or post-show ritual where I'm able to actually put into practice um, the the whole networking, friendship-making aspect of it um, instead of just forgetting about it and, and forgetting who I met and, and what came of it. Your organizational behavior always leaves me feeling inadequate, Jake. Yep. <laughs> but, me too. Um, but I try to I try to follow some of your things, you know, like like with these school visits that I'm doing now. I have yeah. a, a Google Doc that where I take notes on like the conversation to spark the memory, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, that's but good. I, I've never seen anybody make a, a binder for all the <laughs> <laughs> all the cards and stuff. Ain't gonna happen for me. <laughs> Well, what I mean, I'm I'll probably throw it away in five years if it if it doesn't work or whatnot. But it's it's what's doing it right now because, you know, I'll look through that thing and instead of putting all their contact information in my notebook, it'll just say keep in touch. So then I can go back into that folder, pull out their mm-hmm. card, and and contact them. Mm-hmm. But I the reason I do this, you guys, I have a defective brain. My brain <sighs> is very good at daydreaming and getting distracted and following little rabbit trails, you know, and and just see where they go. And it's really good at like drawing pictures and writing stories. And it's not super organized and it doesn't like to retain numbers and it doesn't like to retain names and dates and things like that. And so I have all of these like um, systems in place 
to like make up for my brain's deficiencies. And I just found, I just realized like life is so much easier when it's true. When you like give you help yourself, when you help out future Jake, like you always <laughs> just want to be like, I'm going to give future Jake a solid. I'm doing this right now. And, uh, and future Jake is always so grateful or present Jake right now is so grateful for past Jake. It's funny cause it'll save so much time too. And, and it pushes you, propels you towards success. Mm-hmm. I mean, I learned that even when I was it, in the past nine weeks, I've been remodeling and every single time I start something, I lose all the screws associated with that project. Yeah. And so <laughs> I learned to have a little light colored cup that all screws go in when I'm working on a project. And mm-hmm. so they never, I'm never like searching around or dropping them and, and didn't pick them up or anything like that. Everything goes into that. And then, like you said, it's, it saves your future self the problem of finding it. So if you did that over and over throughout all your processes, think about how much, how much farther I would be. I would definitely have all those emails and I would probably have that $3,000 that I lost at the office. Yeah, probably. Well, <laughs> if I just planned a little better. Well, I mean, it's simple stuff too. Like I, I bless my wife's heart and thank I am so grateful that she like took a chance on me and stuck with me because she essentially had to compensate for all of this for, for so many years. <laughs> but it'd be like, I was just always losing my wallet all like all the time. Where'd I put my wallet? Where'd I put my wallet? <laughs> and she said, Jake, have one spot where your wallet goes and keep it in that spot. And if it's so smart it, and you never put it anywhere unless it's that spot. And I was like, well, that makes sense. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> and and ever since I've been doing that, it's like I always know it exactly works. where my wallet is. And the only time I can't find my wallet is when I forget when I when I don't do that thing. Yep. Right. And so I just apply that to everything else in life. Like have one system, one spot, one place to do this. And anywhere my life is like crazy and doesn't doesn't work is where I haven't come up with a system for that. So the, I came up with that system, and it's, I call it the essential four. Have you ever gone to the grocery store and you fill your cart? You mm-hmm. go to the checkout and you don't have your wallet? <laughs> the essential four. The essential four, keys and wallet, uh, phone and glasses. I can't survive yeah. in the world. Then there's, yeah. the, then there's the, the add-on two, the extras, which is sunglasses. Pants. Sunglasses and <laughs> breath mints. Okay. <laughs> Let me. Can I give an unsolicited shout out? Because I had the same problem that Jake did, but I solved it in a different way. I found that I would always lose my wallet. I mean, multiple times a day, <laughs> but never my phone. Mm. And so I got phone a wallet. phone wallet. Phone wallet. And they were really terrible for a, a long time. This one is made by a company called Smart Smartish. S M A R T I S H. Got it on Amazon. I think it's like 18 bucks. Best $18 I've ever spent. You can put as many cards as you want in there. It's got a, like a little um, pressure kind of backing that puts pressure mm-hmm. on it so the cards never like can fall out or it gets stretched or whatever. Um, and it's just been amazing. And I never, ever lose it because it's all it's, I've got five cards in there and they but stay you know, in there. If you do. You're you're really you're oh double you are hosed. screwed you are well no because no here's the thing because my phone has the tracking in it so like if you've got a watch or if anybody mm-hmm. else in your family has the mm-hmm. Find My app on the and an Apple product mm-hmm. you can find it and and I've done that before where I've kind of misplaced it around the house I know it's here but uh, and it, you can do the play play the sound through the watch it'll ping. So there's a million ways to find that, but the wallet never had all that. I know you can add like an Apple tracker or whatever. I'm going to get one of these. I should just consolidate. That's not a bad it's, idea. It has made my life so much better. And it avoids the, you know, the George Costanza of overstuffing the wallet. You cannot fit more than five <laughs> cards in there. So I've got my insurance, my driver's license, and like a, a, a business credit card, personal credit card. And, Essentials. And, and then if yeah, you just do. just what you need. Yeah, and if you do need your wallet, if you need more than that, switch them out or just grab right, your exactly. wallet. Exactly. Yeah, you rarely need everything all at once. Is there a spot so, for cash? No spot for cash, but I found that with Venmo and everything else, I've, I've been able to work around 99.9% of problems. The only time that's ever come up is if somebody's like unloading some furniture for me or something and I want to tip them and they don't have Venmo. And mm-hmm. I don't have any cash, but I just don't have cash on me anyway. And that's made my life a little bit better too. Cause I'm terrible. Did I tell you I just lost $300? Oh, 
No. It's always a divisible by three. I was, like, this is so stupid. I was at the, going to the post office and we had somebody, oh, somebody was coming um, in to look after our cats and we were yeah. leaving on a trip or whatever and I had like $300 cash and I didn't want to leave it out on a desk or something like that. I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and so I just grabbed it and put it in my pocket. Well, I always, I only wear my glasses when I need to read something typically or I'm looking at a screen mm-hmm. kind of close this per- distance I'm looking at you guys at so I don't normally wear my glasses in other words so my glasses also go in the pocket which means this basically little grabber arms is what the uh the <laughs> little the handles are on the what do you call these things the frames uh, on the glasses are and so they go in my pocket and then when I pull out the glasses it the money gets wadded up or you know stuck in in in, yeah. in the glasses and just comes right out and that's what I did went to the post office pulled out my glasses somebody got 300 bucks so stupid. Dang it. <laughs> now I always, my whole life is measured in terms of making up the money I lost. Every time I'm like, okay, right. it's $300. Okay, I'm back to even. But then I'm still $300 <laughs> behind. <laughs> 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 anyway. Oh, anyway. Well, should we wrap it up? Let's wrap. Let's wrap. All right. Three Point Perspective is brought to you by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts are Will Terry, uh, Lee White, and I'm Jake Parker. Um, We want to give shout outs to everyone who helps make this podcast possible. Podcast is produced by Daniel Tu, that's Daniel Tu, T U, and his website is DanielTu.co. Uh, special thanks to our keeper of curriculum, Austin Shirtlift, our show notes wrangler, Lily Howell, our chief operations officer, Lisa Fott. And I think that's it. Now it's up to you to go draw something. Go draw something. Hey, have you guys heard that riddle? The If you, if you steal $100 out of the register from a shopkeeper and then while well, he's not looking and then you buy $70 worth of goods... Mm-hmm. from that same shopkeeper mm-hmm. uh, and then you leave the store how much money did the shopkeeper lose i'm always surprised oh. at how bad people do on this one wait so, say it again because I'm, I'm looking that re- you recap steal, so you, you steal a hundred mm-hmm. out of the till just a hundred dollar bill mm-hmm. and then you buy seventy dollars worth of goods from his store so now you only have 30 bucks left you have over. 30 bucks left over in he it's cost him um, seventy, but he only made thirty-five on that. Yeah, so. is he buying stuff wholesale, or is See, he? This is this is the imperfect <laughs> nature of the question, right? So if you go on, if you go on it on the potential of what you know of what it's worth to him, that's how most people answer it, right? Seventy dollars mm-hmm. worth of goods. Just go straight up. The goods are worth seventy dollars. Go on that. Okay. How much will? No, you. I'm asking you guys. It's a, he's out thirty. He's out uh, thirty bucks. That's how much thirty bucks. Took. What? That's how much you took. No, the the shopkeeper. How much is he out? Thirty oh, bucks. Because because you bought you, the stuff with but there's his the own goods. money. Yeah, but you there's bought, the goods that you, are you gone too. You stole the seventy dollars worth of goods, so he's out a hundred. Where's my mic? I want to mic drop this. No, 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 no. Look, <laughs> he, he, there's a hundred, hundred bucks. You've, you have a hundred dollars cash that he yeah. used to have. Yeah. You now have it. You get, you buy seventy dollars worth of stuff. So now the yeah. guy's got seventy dollars. So he's right. out thirty dollars cash, but he's also out the pr- the wholesale right. value of the product that you took. But you or, can't. But don't go on the wholesale. Or the go full value. Okay, so 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 forget forget the product yeah. stuff. He's out thirty dollars. So he's out a hundred bucks. He's out thirty. Because you essentially stole thirty dollars and seventy dollars worth of from him. No, but he said store. forget the product. So if it's no, just cash. No, I'm not saying forget. I'm saying get, go on the retail cost okay. of the product. Just oh, tell us. Oh, Will. oh, okay. Yeah, I'm right, aren't I? You're right, Jake. It, that's how yeah. most people answer it. But Lee's right in that, and I mean, uh, you would have come at this too, Jake. Is that what if you know we don't know what the goods cost him? What you know, so, some markups are different. If it's a hundred percent markup, then really he should be out sixty-five bucks, right? Because mm-hmm. he's out the thirty dollars that you walked 30, out the store with, plus the plus re- thirty-five, the, the wholesale value of the goods, which would be thirty-five. So he's really out right. sixty-five dollars. Yeah, yeah. That was that was what but, I came uh, up. But you with. can't answer it that way. 
they none of the online stuff. And you know what's weird is on Facebook, so many people say two hundred dollars, and I'm like, where? Two the hundred. <laughs> they, you won't believe how many people say two hundred dollars. What? Oh, people are terrible at math. No I mean, they do. The, they don't even understand like the PEMDAS. They don't. You know, and the, they like, can't, the simple math problem. They can't realize that you gave it back. They, their brain can't do that. They're like, well, you stole a mm. hundred, and then you stole. And I don't even know how they do <laughs> yeah, it. How they got That's weird. There. <laughs> Have you heard the one where um, Cuckoo. The, you're on a trip, you go to this small town, you, you want to stay for the night, there's a hotel. So you go into the hotel, and at this hotel, you pay 100 bucks for a, for a, a oh, room I've for heard the night. One. Right? Three guys, and, right? Wait, wait, wait. Start over. Start over. Give me, let me do the math here. Okay, so go ahead. No, you do it, Will, because I may not remember it. Exactly. I, it's hard for me to remember. There's three guys, though. And yeah. Dang not it. three guys going to okay, the hotel. So here, I'll, I'll, I'll look priest, it up really quick. A Jew, I'll, and a. No, no, no. I'll look it up really quick. Because <laughs> this is a good one. And people screw this one up, too. There's an extra <laughs> dollar. Remember that, Jake? Three Maybe. Guys. Well, because you can I'll, only do it. It'd be a 33 really? cent. For thirty dollars, here we go. Here we go. So the thing is, um, it's a, it's a, it's the bellboy thing. So three men go into a hotel. A man behind the desk says a room is thirty dollars. So each man pays ten dollars and goes up to the room. Okay. So mm -hmm. right now we got three dudes. They all reached mm -hmm. in their pocket. They gave ten dollars at the front desk. They all went up to the room. A while later, the man behind the desk realized the room was only $25. So he sent the bellboy back to the three guys' room with the $5. On the way, the bellboy couldn't figure out how to split five evenly between three men. So he gave each man a dollar and kept the other two for himself. Mm -hmm. Right? This meant that the three men each paid $9 for the room, which is a total of 27 and the two... That the bellboy kept equals twenty nine. Where's the extra dollar? <laughs> what? <laughs> I've seen that before, and I, fi I figured out where the dollar was. Hold on, let me. Let where me, is the extra me. dollar? No, 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 no. Let me do it again. Hold on. I, I it's easy. I just need to write it down. So ten. Two, so thirty dollars total. It's that a wackadoo, makes no man. No sense to me. It's a wackadoo. Twenty five dollars. So. So five dollars is left. I can't even begin to unpack this. My brain doesn't work <laughs> like that. I guess each of them a dollar, which does okay. mean that they pay twenty seven dollars. It's a five there's five dollars. It's thirty dollars. Can you do it with say it's three hundred and and two fifty? And uh, so, and it turns out it's two fifty. Does that change the, the math at all? You know, it's there ten dollars that, that appears out of nowhere right. or that's lost? It's crazy though that somebody came up with this. Um, I'm Did you figure it out, Lee? Let's see. I'm gonna have Spidey sense tingling. Waiter. <laughs> I like how we're all just like, uh. I'm looking at the answer, but the answer doesn't make sense. Every dollar must be accounted for regardless of, of its location. Okay, two, so each of the three guests has one dollar in his pocket totaling three dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And when added to the 27, that equals 30. To obtain the, the sum that totals to the original 30, every dollar must be accounted for regardless of its location. This sum does indeed come out to 30. So it says, so you have to just work it backwards because it's mm -hmm. leading you down. It's leading you down a rabbit hole you don't want to go down. So I don't really understand. So it's sort of it's sort of a misdirect. Yeah, right. When the money goes back, each to them. of so the three they, guests now has a dollar in his pocket. So there's count those three, right? Mm -hmm. And then when added to the twenty-seven, revised cost of the room, but the room was twenty-five. So that doesn't oh no, but sense. but no, that's right, that's right. So each oh, person right, has right, a dollar in his pocket. In the bell hop. The two dollars of the bellhop and the but it still doesn't change that each person. Oh, that's has right. Because the bellhop told them it was twenty-seven. Here's a dollar each. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that works. So it's just you have to count for every where each dollar is. 
Yeah. No, but ultimately they have each paid nine dollars though. Right. Uh, that's the twenty seven. And then the bellhop has the two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> twenty eight, twenty nine. But you're trying to get to the original thirty. So Right. You don't, don't worry about make- the cost. You just say, Where are all the dollars? Right. And the and you say each I man has like a dollar in his pocket. <laughs> the the people who fi- whoever fi- like thought up of that riddle uh-huh. are the same people who run the banking system. Uh-huh. <laughs> like <laughs> I hope that don't worry about that extra dollar. I hope, I'm I'm I'm, I'm no a little leery dollar. that this would make it into banter in the podcast because it it just exposes the fact that we are truly artists. Yeah, we're we're the biggest. Dummies. Well, I mean that's made that's made to be a trick, you know. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a <laughs> thing, was, you know. And that wasn't the thing I was going to say. The, this is a weird thing about money is um, one guy goes buys a hotel room for a hundred bucks. The hotel owner. He's in debt. And it's this little town, right? He's in debt to his staff, the house cleaning. He owes uh-huh. them a hundred bucks. So the house cleaner now has hundred bucks. Well, she had to pay rent and she was short on rent. So she went and pays, um, she pays rent. She pays a hundred bucks to pay for her rent. And now she's cool. Well, the person who was renting her house needed to pay the plumber to fix all the toilets, right? So now that hundred bucks goes to the plumber. That plumber then goes to the grocery store and, you know, pays for uh, a Thanksgiving dinner with mm-hmm. it, right? So now the grocery store clerk has a hundred bucks, right? Mm-hmm. And so then, um, you know, somewhere on the way out of town, the guy, you know, sells something. He like sells a, a you know, he's got a, a vacuum cleaner in, in the back. He's a vacuum cleaner salesman. The, who's staying the night in this hotel, he sells a vacuum cleaner to somebody for a hundred bucks. And so somehow the money ended up right where it started, but everybody was able to like right. pay thing, off yeah. everything. Yeah, And I, sometimes I feel like that's what an artist alley is at one of these shows Yeah, where money in motion, everybody <laughs> comes in, they need money, they make money, but then they spend the money and somehow <laughs> nobody <laughs> You know, everybody nobody made sort of, money, nobody lost money, but then you ended yeah. up with new stuff too. So yeah, yeah. somehow. <laughs> oh my God. That money is in motion. And if you think about what the government gets in taxes, mm-hmm. when money moves, like at every step, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy to think of how much money is collected in taxes. Yeah. Cause uh, yeah. Each one of those movements, there should be tax paid. Right. 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 <laughs> Guys, let's start a government. Yeah. <laughs> That's our get rich quick scheme. Jake Landia. Uh, Anybody want to come well, be a, a, I live s- in Jake Landia? I just sold a book. That guy that stuck his head in wants a book. So I got to run one down to his house. I promised him. That hey, I, I got to get handed you the Brand money. Orders. So I made money during the podcast. I made. Dang. Uh, I, I made wonder if I sold bucks. anything on my shop during the podcast. I'm starting to sell a bunch of stuff right now due to the holidays. Um, do you guys think I should do that show? Uh, it, I love the idea of a Christmas show. If I had stuff like you, I would want to, but there's obviously there's an opportunity cost because you're going to, someone has to staff it, right? Someone has it's to. It's only a there. week. I mean, that's what, what I fit. Cause Lisa was like, well, you're, aren't you, aren't you ramping up for self-publishing pro? And I said, well, during the week, I bet I'm just sitting there for long stretches of time. I can like plan and right. organize and all that. <sighs> I mean, yeah. I love the idea. I've always wanted to. I've always wanted to have one of those shows close by that I could do. I mean, my my pro is I've got nothing else in the Denver market. I have no idea. Like I said on the podcast, I have no idea of where once, to even start. Yeah, once I saw what kind of show it was or or event it was, I I was thinking, unless you have some very Christmassy, like easily giftable stuff you're not going to do very well at that. Mm -hmm. Like if you're, you know, it might even be too late for someone to buy Christmas cards, you know, greeting cards or something like that. Mm. Cause they've already mailed them all out. You should, at that point, you should frame, think about framing little ones, five by sevens, eight by 10 sizes, prints. So that they're they're, already framed. they're, They're a gift right there. Just little cheap frames on them. Just think about it. 
No, it's, where someone can, it's complete. They don't have to do anything else. They're like, oh, I'll give this to so and so. Boom! Yeah, it's done. I mean, people do like the framed stuff. It's for just such bathroom, a big hassle you know. for me. And then, I, and then they're like, oh, do you have this in gold? Like I'm, like I'm a store. Like I'm Target. <laughs> hey, I just got a, a referral. You guys, I just got a, a librarian who wants me. Who someone else referred me. Now that's why I want Dude. to do the show. Exactly what just happened to you. You do one thing. You know what? All of a sudden. Do it for that, but do you do you have to be there all week to do that? Somebody did. I mean, I can alternate with Lisa every other day. Yeah. That's do you know a college kid who needs part time job? That's not a bad idea. I mean, I could use Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design mm -hmm. and go through them. Mm -hmm. I would. I would. But Lisa I could would do, do it too. just as long as you are still able to do the podcast that week. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, that's no problem. I mean, it, we... my, I don't even go there till noon. So okay, okay, yeah. Are we doing a podcast this Wednesday as well? Oh, hey, let's. Catch we up. got we got the last week of CBP. This is week ten, so we should all three be there. Yeah, right. let's uh, let's cut cut it off right here and have our meeting. What I'm meeting? still recording. <laughs> okay, stop recording. <laughs> Hold on. Sorry, if Daniel. you made it this far, give us a dollar bill emoji. No, we cannot. Daniel, cut all this stuff out. <laughs> I 